There is a saying in basketball, ball don't lie. On the court, the truth has a way of making itself known, one way or another. And the truth is that Asia Wilson can ball. WNBA champion, two-time MVP, Olympic gold medalist. Her game surely says enough, but she'll still let you know about it. It's easy to think that this level of confidence, rooted in an absolute belief in yourself and your abilities, is something that you're born with. But the truth didn't always come so easily to Asia. As a teenager, she wanted to hide from it, just as she did the letters on the blackboard, which jumbled together in her mind and didn't quite match up. This was one of many secrets she shared with her grandmother as they sat under the shade of a big tree in the front yard in sleepy South Carolina. Her insecurities, her fears. Nowadays, Asia isn't so afraid of the truth. What changed? How did she come so far? To answer this, we need to look back at the inspiring journey of Asia Wilson. How she overcame lost, low moments and a learning disability to find her authentic voice. And how her bravery to speak the truth made her the best in the world. When Hattie Rakes was growing up in Columbia, South Carolina, she lived just a few minutes away from the state's flagship public university. Despite the proximity, she had never seen the campus up close. Whenever she went that way, she had to walk around. Black people weren't allowed. It was the 1920s, and this was just one of the many indignities she faced on a daily basis living in the segregated South. No matter how strong an emotion the constant unfairness made her feel inside, she was forced to bottle it up. As such, she had developed a quiet strength, a resilience to keep going in the face of the seemingly insurmountable. Years later, listening to her granddaughter complain about the shame of being singled out in front of the entire classroom, she knew how it felt. The one thing Asia hated most was popcorn reading. One student would be chosen to start reading aloud to the class, once that student finished a paragraph, they would say the word popcorn, followed by another student's name, indicating whose turn it was to pick things up. Asia dreaded that the name would be hers. Whenever it was, she made a subtle glare at her new enemy and stood up to read. The first few words came out fine, but somewhere midway through the first sentence, they slowed down, and eventually things ground to a halt. Whenever Asia froze up like this, she would laugh it off. Her teachers told her she was just being lazy and she wanted to believe them. Inside though, she knew the truth. At home, she was working harder than anybody, spending hours alone at the desk in her bedroom, reading books in an attempt to catch up. No matter how hard she tried, longer complicated passages still eluded her comprehension. Reading just did not come easily. Grandma Hattie comforted Asia. She would get it eventually. No matter how embarrassed those moments made her feel, the most important thing was her attitude. And that's something that my grandma really taught me when I would have my breakdowns about, you know, being a normal kid and getting to do stuff. She's like, the Lord did not put you on this earth to be normal. So why, why want to be that? It was around this time that Asia was introduced to basketball. At 11 years old, she looked like a basketball player, but she didn't play like one. Her game was, in a word, sorry. This was the assessment of her dad, Roscoe, who knew a thing or two, having played professionally for 10 years across Europe and South America. But this lack of skill didn't much bother Asia. While lanky and a bit uncoordinated, she had a natural love for the game. At least in the gym, unlike in school, her hard work seemed to pay off. In the sport, she had found a new outlet, a place she could be herself without fear of judgment. She liked sitting on the end of the bench, handing out water, cheering on her teammates. One day, after another long drive to attend one of Asia's games, where she didn't log a single minute, Roscoe had had enough. Asia, we're not going to pay for you to sit on the end of the bench. We want you to play. While he probably wasn't serious, Roscoe wanted to challenge his daughter. He knew there was something great inside of her, if only she could pull it out. Asia was an athlete after all. The only difference between an athlete and a basketball player, in his experience, was the willingness to be coached. Asia took the challenge to heart. What did she have to do to get on the court? Roscoe set up a hoop in the driveway, and Asia, with a newfound excitement, went about figuring it out. Before long, she started getting in the game, 
And pretty soon after that, she was a major contributor to her team's success. As Asia continued to grow, both in her game and in her height, she recognized that she had the chance to go even further. Dad, she said one day out of the blue, I want to be the best basketball player in the country. Roscoe, caught off guard, asked Asia if she was serious. She was. Asia, you've got to commit yourself. If you want to do this, there's no backing down. When Asia arrived at her first basketball camp at the University of South Carolina, upon her dad's urging, her game was far from a finished product, so far from one that she was sent to the second gym, reserved for the less skilled players. Throughout the week, she put in work, though with limited results, clanging hundreds of jumpers off the rim, her shooting mechanics not having caught up with her effort level. On the last day of camp, new South Carolina head coach Don Staley came to hand out participation certificates to the players. Coach had spent most of her time in the main gym, so she was a bit surprised when a tall girl with an unfamiliar face came up to collect hers. Asia Wilson, huh? I'm going to remember this name. Yeah, right, Asia probably thought. It turns out Dawn knew a baller when she saw one. Having improved over a long summer spent practicing with her dad, Asia burst onto the scene for her school's varsity basketball team, Heathwood Hall, as only an eighth grader. After entering high school, she saw a learning specialist and received a formal diagnosis for dyslexia. Finally, her struggles with reading made sense to her. She wasn't lazy after all. Still though, she felt a bit ashamed and kept her condition private. When her friends asked her where she wanted to go out to eat, she would always choose Chick-fil-A, hoping to avoid the anxiety of having to read an unfamiliar menu. On the court, her game didn't remain a secret for long. During her senior year, she averaged a whopping 35 points and 15 rebounds per game, leading Heathwood Hall to a state title and being named National Player of the Year. A McDonald's All-American and the consensus number one recruit in the 2014 class, she amassed 500 scholarship offers from college programs across the country. As part of the recruiting process, she back-channeled with college coaches to make sure the university had the learning resources in place to support her dyslexia. While the top programs offered her star treatment, Coach Dawn had a simple message. Come to South Carolina, but only if you're willing to work hard. Asia was willing. She signed for South Carolina in front of her jam-packed high school gym, with her grandmother Hattie in attendance. Coach Dawn was hard on Asia. In her mind, number one prospect meant number one effort, number one discipline, and number one expectations. When this pressure became especially tough during one freshman year practice, Asia went crying to her mom, saying that she wanted to transfer. Her mom's response? Asia, you go tell Dawn Expletive Staley that you're going to transfer. Needless to say, Asia did not. Instead, she won SEC Freshman of the Year and followed this up in her second season by winning SEC Player of the Year and leading the Gamecocks to an SEC Championship. Dawn challenged Asia both on and off the court. When Asia wasn't putting in effort rotating into position on defense, she challenged her All-American to become SEC Defensive Player of the Year, which she did her sophomore season. Recognizing the negative impact of Asia's dyslexia on her self-confidence, she assigned the task of reading Bible passages aloud to the team before every game. Coach wanted Asia to understand that her difficulty reading came not because she was less than, but because she was different. And being different wasn't wrong. Actually, it was something to be proud of. Just before Asia started her junior season, she faced the unthinkable. Grandma Hattie passed away at the age of 95. The loss of her grandmother, with whom she was closer than anyone, made her question her future in basketball. What was the point of playing anymore without her rock, the woman who had helped her find her confidence and keep going through all of life's many hurdles? Rather than quitting, Asia decided to dedicate the season to her grandmother, getting the name Hattie Rakes tattooed on her wrist. Prior to every game, she would look at her grandma's name and say a prayer to herself before slipping on her shooting sleeve and jogging out onto the court for warm-ups. Asia's purpose had never been clearer. She wasn't just playing for herself. 
She was playing for her family, her community, and out of an appreciation for all the love and guidance they had given her. When Asia subbed out of that year's national championship game against Mississippi State, with under a minute remaining, the title clearly in hand, she couldn't stop herself from crying. Asked about it in the press conference afterwards, her tears quickly turned into a laugh. If Grandma Hattie were there to see her granddaughter crying like this, Asia said, she would have told her to stop. She always told Asia to stop crying. When all was said and done on Asia's four years in Columbia, she had won the program's first national championship, a collection of National Player of the Year awards, and the honor of being South Carolina's all-time leading scorer. Her improvement from an unpolished but talented player as a freshman to a cerebral complete player as a senior was eclipsed only by her maturation off the court. The lessons she learned from Coach Dawn, whom by this point she considered like a second mom, translated to all areas of life. Coach would sometimes see Asia playing poorly during practice and kick her star out, saying, you should never blend in. I see you blending in. Blending in meant backing down from who you really were, hiding some core part of yourself. At a certain point, Asia was no longer willing to hide. With her coach's support, she opened up about her dyslexia publicly, penning an article in the Players' Tribune in 2018. By describing her own challenges, she could be an inspiration for others going through the same, who didn't have such a platform. Asia was drafted number one overall by the Las Vegas Aces in the 2018 WNBA Draft. An immediate impact player and all-star, she won Rookie of the Year in her first season and led the Aces back to the playoffs in her second. On the outside, everything was going about as well as it could. But internally, Asia started to feel that same uncomfortable feeling that she thought she had put behind her. Like back in that middle school classroom, how she acted out in the world was again in conflict with the truth she felt inside. The intense standard of perfection, to be a smiling, energetic role model while delivering her team to the promised land, it was a lot to handle. Some days Asia just didn't feel it. She didn't want to talk to get out of bed. The coronavirus pandemic had forced the WNBA into the so-called wobble environment, meaning that she couldn't see family or friends. Aside from practice and games, she would spend a lot of her time alone in her room. After the Aces were swept in the finals, Asia left the wobble in a dark place. She blamed herself for the loss. Despite being that year's WNBA MVP, she felt like a total loser. At the same time, she felt a pressure not to show it, to put on a mask of strength like her mother and grandmother had exemplified to her for so many years. Black women in America, Asia felt, had to handle every situation with poise and positivity, but she didn't feel either of those things. Those days, it was terrible. Like my, I would have some pretty bad anxiety attacks because yeah. I just felt like I needed to be perfect. I felt like I needed to be the Asia Wilson that everybody wanted. And I lost sight of who Asia Wilson really is. Yeah. And, and that right there, I was like, I would never go back to that place ever again. The truth is commonly romanticized, portrayed as something beautiful. Usually though, it's pretty ugly. Confronting the truth means looking at parts of yourself that you'd prefer to ignore. After an anxiety attack on a family vacation, Asia, perhaps thinking back to the lesson Coach Dawn had taught her about blending in, realized once and for all she didn't want to do that anymore. She opened up about her struggles with depression and anxiety in the media, talking and writing through the truly ugly emotions she felt. If even someone so lucky as her could be going through it, others no doubt were too. If she could convince them that it was okay to not be okay, she would be doing the thing her grandmother had always emphasized the most, being a good person and helping others. Doing so freed her. No longer moving about with the stereotypical stoic intensity often associated with professional athletes, she was pioneering a new way, the Asia Wilson way. Her extreme vulnerability allowed her to become her full self on the court winning another MVP in 2022, and leading the Aces to the WNBA Championship. It's not always easy to be so honest with yourself. But, Asia has learned, what's best isn't always easiest. In life, as in basketball, things have a way of coming full circle. In 2021, Asia returned to the University of South Carolina for a special occasion. 
the school was putting up a statue to celebrate one of its biggest stars. Looking up at the bronze figure of her own likeness, right in the heart of campus in front of the basketball arena, the symbolism wasn't lost on Asia. As she addressed the crowd, classmates, fans, teammates, coaches, she thought of the woman who all those years ago sat quietly under the big tree in the front yard with a kind smile, listening as a young girl told a difficult truth. My grandmother, Hattie Brakes, grew up in this area, actually four, blo four blocks from the governor's mansion to be exact. When she was a child, she couldn't even walk on the grounds of the University of South Carolina. She would have to walk around the campus just to get to where she needed to go. If only she was here today to see that the same grounds she had to walk around, it now is the same grounds that houses a statue of her granddaughter. <laughs>